was four years old, I heard a symphony broadcast from New York uh, in my grandmother's room, and it absolutely blew me away. And I knew, I didn't even know what it was. I just knew that it was, uh, my grandmother said, why don't you come and listen to the, the lovely music with me? And I loved my grandmother, I adored her, and so, and I heard this piece, it, it turned out to be Brahms, the first symphony, and it, it just absolutely opened my skull and rearranged my brains. And I knew, I didn't even know what it was, I didn't know what an orchestra was really or anything like that, but I knew I wanted that. I wanted that, I wanted to do that, whatever it was. And uh, <clears throat> that, that sort of caused me to just, you know, uh, I mean, you're four years old, what can you do? You know, I, I mean, I, was, I wasn't really old enough to, to start learning an instrument yet. I guess my parents didn't think, but I, did, I picked up the violin when I was eight in third grade and, and uh, started taking lessons and I led, later I played in the youth orchestras and stuff like that. Then I switched to trumpet, played, started playing jazz, um, uh, studied composition, composed music, and, uh, and then uh, I got an invitation to join a band. So, so that, in a nutshell, that's, that, that's the kind of the progression. So when did you start kind of playing more of the bluegrass jam stuff? Uh, well, really, um, when, uh, when I joined the band, because I, I had, I had I'd known Jerry Garcia for a long time, five years before, before he uh, invited me to join the band, but I'd always wanted to play with him, but we didn't play the same kind of music. He was playing Billy Grass and folk music, and I was playing jazz and classical, and uh, so it was, it was a kind of never the twain shall meet, and then, uh, but then I, I kind of stopped, I, I kind of got, I, I kind of got, I came to a dead end kind of in music. I, uh, I wasn't in school anymore, and uh, I was, you know, I just had a job, and I was just hanging out, kind of, and and uh, so uh, Jerry kind of saved my life by you know, inviting me to join the band. He just said, "I know you can pick up this instrument, you know, which I'd never played the bass before." But uh, and uh, he was right; it was pretty easy to pick it up and start playing. And uh, you know, I just never looked back from there. Well, I, we were we were the Warlocks, and this is 1965, and we'd been playing as the Warlocks for about six months. And I uh, I was up in San Francisco one day. I don't even know why, but I was in a record store looking through records, and I came upon a 45 single by a band called the Warlocks. Uh, okay, so I mean that's that was bad news for us because I mean if the, if there if there was another band named the Warlocks that was just in, in this, some garage band somewhere. Uh, that would have been different, but this band was uh, like recording, and they had obviously had a contract, and so if we wanted to continue, we'd probably have a lawsuit on our hands from them. So I went, I, I, I went. I didn't even bother to listen to the to the record, but somebody told me, or I read somewhere, that the Warlocks was the name that the Velvet Underground used when they before they got started as the Velvet Underground. So maybe they heard about us and changed their name. You know, it's kind of funny. So uh, I, I went back and I told the guys, I said, hey, you know, we can't be the Warlocks anymore. There's a band already that's recording. And, uh, oh, the consternation, oh, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to call ourselves? And everybody threw out, was throwing out names, and none of, and they were all awful. My favorite was the mythical, ethical, icicle, tricycle. Okay, so enough said about that. And, uh, and so we were in, in, in the middle of this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, really crazy, you know, trying to figure out what, we're, what we want to call ourselves, period. And Jerry came over to my house one day and, I, and he said, okay, let's, let's find a name. So we, went, we started sitting down and I, I had a bunch of reference books. We, we went through the encyclopedia and, uh, and Bartlett's quotations and, you know, uh, you know, looking for maybe some cool line from Shakespeare or something we could use. And Jerry just picks up this old dictionary that my girlfriend just happened to have around. It was her grandmother. And he picked it up and he, and he just opened it and he, he, the book fell open and he looked at me and he said, hey man, how about the Grateful Dead? I just jumped up and down because that was it, you know, I mean, and the other, some of the other guys in the band didn't really like the name at first, you know, they thought it was too weird, but uh, it stuck. <laughs> we sort of, we sort of, Jerry and I sort of rammed it, rammed it through, you know. Everybody brought a different influence to the table. Jerry had folk and bluegrass. Um, 
and brought some rock and roll background because he originally wanted to play rock and roll. And in fact, he was he played guitar on a on a single by this guy Bobby Freeman called "Do You Want to Dance?" And I don't know when it was sixty three or sixty four maybe. And, oh no, it wasn't even that. It was like in the fifties. In any case, uh, Bobby brought brought uh, folk and rock influences. Billy Kreutzmann was uh, was deeply into jazz music and rock music. Pigpen was blues and R&B, and I was jazz and, and classical music and weird electronica kind of stuff. And so we had this goulash, this stew of stuff, of musical influences that, that uh, everybody, everybody sort of wanted, you know, so, so it, we were, what we were looking to do was to fuse all these things into a kind of a, an individual voice. And we were eventually able to do that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's funny because I, I don't think I, I don't think there are many bands that had that many diverse influences involved in the, uh, when they were first getting together. Now, as you know, that was the '60s, and now as you know, time goes on, you can tell that the music in San Francisco, the music that's music that's coming out of San Francisco, is changing. How did it change for you guys when the '70s and the '80s came up? Well, uh, if, uh, by that time, it, it wasn't really San Francisco music. It was it was Grateful Dead music, and uh, the Grateful Grateful Dead music just evolved in its own way. Uh, we 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 went through our <clears throat> we went through our our uh, psychedelic ranger period where it was, it was like crazed improvisation and, and you know, 45-minute uh, songs and, uh, and uh, uh, feedback and, and all kinds of sound of effects and, and, uh, and just, you know, super, uh, super far-out impro improvisatory kind of music. And then in about 1970, uh, Jerry and Hunter started writing songs. Like neat little, uh, you know, like three-minute, four-minute songs that that told stories, or were you know they were definite. They were definitely uh, uh, it, the song form kind of came to the fore, which had it hadn't been there before uh, in that in that respect, and and that 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 sort of turned us in, uh, you know that that sort of we, we we sort of just went in that direction for well, three or four years. And then, then after we took a break in like '75 and came back to touring and, and, and playing together in uh, in late '75, and by, at that point it's, it seemed like what we were trying to do is to fuse those two approaches so that we take these little songs and string them together and and then put put wild jams and improvisational um, music in between them and sometimes open up the song in the middle and do some and, and just 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 go into some other world and then come back to the song and finish it and so and that was pretty much that was pretty much the uh, the, the the model the paradigm for our music uh, then for the next 20 years or so was the fusion of those two things the wild you know uh, balls against the wall improvisation and and the tight little song that told a story or or uh, set a scene or, or created an emotional uh, situation. So uh, it was it was pretty much A B and then A B. Yeah. For those uh, little stories that were being told in the songs, what was influencing you guys to you know write and tell that story? Well, it's a funny thing about how songs come into being. It's like they're like poems. They uh, that, that, that anything can trigger it. Uh, you can hear a you can hear a squeaky brake drum uh, on a truck somewhere that coincides with a jackhammer uh, in a construction project, and the combination of those two things will suggest a musical idea, uh, a rhythm, you know, or a melodic a, a little melodic riff or something like that, and and that and, and that that just starts a musician's mind working. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't go anywhere, and sometimes, sometimes then there'll be a, 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 a melody will will arise out of that. And uh, the same way with a poet um, or, 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 a, or a lyric, a lyricist, uh, a, a phrase spoken in a, uh, in a, in a in a overheard in a coffee shop, or um, a, a, a line that a line in a, in a letter that somebody writes you, or a, a street sign even can trigger, it just triggers associations. And those associations can, can form themselves into a line. And, and, then, and then it's just it's like a question of trying out the line, see where it goes. Try, okay, here's, the, here's line A. 
Uh, does this work well with it uh, to make a line B? No, let's, let's, okay, how about this? You know, and it, it, you sort of build it up brick by brick, as it were. And so, um, that, I mean, it's, and, but at the same time, lyricists especially are influenced by what they read. And musicians, of course, are influenced by what they hear. So there's a lot of subconscious borrowing that goes on. Uh, I mean, this is, and this has been this has been traditional in music uh, at least for hundreds of years. Bach and Handel, for instance, in the in the in the, uh, um, in the 18th century, were uh, notorious uh, borrowers. They borrowed from each other. They borrowed from themselves, and they just they just they're, they're, they would just continually transform their music. And that was also happening in classical music in the 20th century, where composers like Berio. And uh, Boulez would would uh, they would never complete the piece. They would they would always be adding to it or or, co or continuing it. You know, so uh, it's it's a kind of a time honored tradition. So the the, the combination of you know just uh, just immediate uh, uh, inspiration that that something something you see or hear or read, and, and those influences that are always part of you. Uh, it's a combination of all those things. That that, that that's where that's the that's the basic the ground that the music or that, that that the songs arise from. Because when 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 we when we when we're satisfied and and, and we're getting off on what we're doing, the audience is going to get off on it too. Um, that uh, what 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 we're basically trying to do is we're taking that energy that's coming from the audience. And we're trying to transmute it and, 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 and trying to trying to take it to a higher level in a way by transforming the raw energy into into something something that has form and it t and tells a story in its own way. Um, but but what, basically what's happening is we're trying to tap into that eternal that eternal music that's always playing in the cosmos out there somewhere. And we just we just uh, the best thing we can do. Uh, or best thing I can do as a musician is to uh, lose myself, is to forget about myself and uh, forget about that whatever it is I'm trying to do, and just be all ears and hands. You know, there's there's no there's no ego or no no fill there at, at all at the at the best moments. There's there's nobody there. There's only the music, which comes through that pipeline, and in in, in relation to what else you're hearing from the other musicians. And then you you just you just pass it through, you know, and uh, that's that's when the, that's when it's the best, and that's when the audience knows that it, that 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 it's it's you know that they got a good one. And it, of course, it doesn't always happen. It's, there's a little bit of a random uh, uh, element to it, but you can but with years and years of of experience, you can open yourself. You can learn how to open yourself to those moments and make them and sustain them for longer. Hard to say. Oh, Crosby, Stills and Nash for sure. Uh, they, they just sang so beautifully and uh, we, uh, and, and, uh, we, uh, we got, we, uh, uh, we'd known Crosby for a long time, but, uh, but they started, uh, they, they, they were, Crosby moved up here in like 69 or something and we, and we were hanging out together and they, they were, when we, when we were starting to write our songs, when we were starting to move into that the song space, from uh, from the, the psychedelic uh, improvisational space, uh, they were ha they happened to be hanging out, and so they sort of they coached us a little, you know, on on harmony singing stuff, and uh, and it was really it was really very very fruitful, and we actually learned to sing better uh, through uh, hanging out with them, and uh, uh, well, there's you know there's always influences that that, that come by, but it's ne it's for me it was rarely rock and roll bands. Uh, it would be individual musicians or some 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 drummer that plays a certain way. And I thought, wow, I really dig that. And so I would play. As I, then I'd go back to the band and I would play as if that guy were playing in our band. And it would change. It would, it would change the way that our drummers played, you know, and everybody else in the band too. So uh, it's just. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't even remember the names of, of some of these people, but. So, so for me, it wasn't necessarily an influence of another band or anything like that. It was like isolated musicians, and then all of the all of the other music that I'm constantly listening to: world music, uh, jazz music, classical music. You know. well, my my two main heroes are John Coltrane and uh, and uh, Charles Ives. Do you know? Have you ever heard of Charles Ives? He's an he's an American composer, born in 1874, and uh, yeah, he's he's like uh, he's like the the original. 
transcendentalist American composer. He, he, he's a, he came out of the, the philosophical school of, the Emerson, of Emerson and Thoreau and the Alcotts in, in, uh, in New England. And uh, also and very, very heavily influenced by Whitman as well. So, uh, and, and, and uh, his, his music is, to me, is, is the ultimate, it's, it's, the, it's the ultimate music in a sense because what it does is, is it provides you with a picture, of, uh, a picture of somebody's consciousness, somebody's entire mind with all of the little, all of the little side trips and little crannies and the, the things, that, things you're, that you're thinking about that you don't know you're thinking about while you're thinking about something else. Levels of awareness and of, of, of thought processes, they're all, and they're all, in, they're all intertwined in this music. And I've used a lot of uh, popular tunes of his day and hymn tunes from church, and he would weave them into the symphonic fabric. And uh, the, 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 the totality of it is just absolutely stunning, and it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like there's a human being here in front of you. With all, with all this different kind of thoughts and emotions and flaws all happening at the same time, just like in real life. So, and uh, that that was that was such a a, a huge inf uh, hit on me. I mean, it just you know it was it was uh, it was comparable really to uh, to my, my first experience with music. It's like, oh man, you know, how, how do you do this? <laughs> I want to do that too, you know. So. Anyway, so th those two guys are my real, are my main artistic heroes, and, uh, and you know, of course, all, all of the ma all the great masters of, of of jazz and classical music have have had had an influence on me. Um, the, my style of bass playing is is essentially modeled on Bach. Uh, the, I mean, there certainly seems to be a, there seems, certainly seems to be a lot of musicians that that have that have gained something from from what, what we did. There's a whole jam band scene now of, of bands that that uh, starting with Fish and uh, and uh, um, I guess there's a, a there's a young band Humphreys McGee and there's this band Particle that uh, they they, they uh, fuse electronica and jam band uh, uh, improvisation and so you know there there are there's a whole scene of, of bands that basically are modeled on the Grateful Dead in, in that they do a lot of improvisation in, the, in their songs and between their songs. And, uh, and that's, that's really gratifying to see that that, 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 that kind of took root. And, uh, and, and as far as the mainstream is concerned, I don't really think Grateful Dead had much influence on the mainstream. Well, you know, I, I, I think I had a, I had a lot to do with the, the effect on the, on, uh, the audience. Because what we were trying to do was we were trying to create a community. You know, it's, it's, it wasn't so much we were out there playing, uh, playing our records so that people would buy our record. We were out there playing music so that people would come back and listen to us and, uh, again and again. And one of the ways we did that was to, we would never play the same show twice. Uh, the set list would always be different and we'd always play each song as differently as we could, given, given the, the, the nature of the song. So uh, I think that I think that that was very attractive to, to many many listeners is that, that that they could keep coming back and 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 hearing something new instead of, instead of if you if you go go to your you know your mainstream bands you, you'll hear the same set list every night if you follow them along on the tour and uh, as much as you love the band it can get a little it can get boring you know oh, here comes uh, here comes that song again uh, you know right in the same place in the set and so on. So we uh, and, and and what what we were, we were always trying to do with our music from the very beginning was to um, was to create a community, um, uh, a, a situation where everyone was of the same mind, as it were. In other words, we were, we were trying to create a unified consciousness in the in the place where we were playing. Well, it's almost it, almost like a communion in, in the church, and we in fact used to say. Every place we play is church because we're trying to bring people together. Great, thank you. Oh, you're